uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Vyashini Roy, and I welcome you all to the stories of uh, the Indian Diaspora series with reference to Team Bias Reviews June 2021 project that is inviting stories on the Indian Diaspora. This is basically to investigate the ambition based movement under our annual theme of migration, uh, displacement, resettlement. Today, we are honored to present Professor Chandrima Chakraborty. She is a professor in the Department of English and Cultural Studies and director of the Center for Peace Studies. Her research is on public memory, nationalist history, masculinity, and religion, with a focus on the literatures and cultures of South Asia and South Asian diaspora. Her book publications include Masculinity, Asceticism, and Hinduism, Past and Present Imaginings of India, Mapping South Asian Masculinities, Men and Political Crisis, and the Co-edited Anthology, Remembering Air India, the Art of Public Mourning over the last decade. She has refocused the attention of the scholarly community and the general public on the 1985 Air India bombings through conferences, publications and community outreach. She's been conducting interviews with families and friends of those who died on Air India Flight 182 for the first ever archival collection on Air India, engaging McMaster Library as the repository, thereby creating a public site for memorialization and ongoing research. We welcome you, ma'am. And a very good morning to you. Also, yeah, also, we have Megha Mazumdar joining us today. She's currently a student of English literature, pursuing her master's from St. Xavier's College, Kolkata, India. She has always had a knack for writing and is also a part time content writer and proofreader. She has been writing poems since her childhood and her major turning point in life has been Keats's transromantic poems. She also takes keen interest in learning new languages and is declaring about her fluency in seven different languages as of now. She also extends her reach to learning about multilingual poetry, her current area of interest being Spanish imagist poetry. She is published in several national and uh, international journals, uh, including the Criterion. We welcome you, Megha. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, yeah. welcome you, ma'am. It's really lovely to have you today. Thank you. Okay, so uh, ma'am, uh, let's begin uh, with your journey of migration. What uh, motivated you to migrate to Canada? Uh, so first, maybe I'll just say, you know, thank you for this lovely opportunity. I don't know what to expect, so we will see how this goes. But, you know, <laughs> Um, you know, I'm both a little bit nervous, but excited to be part of this uh, conversation. Um, so thank you. And uh, so in terms of, you know, migration, I would say it was chance. There was no plans to come to Canada. I had no family, no relatives, you know, and nobody that I knew in Canada. So it was okay. a chance. I was doing my um, mm -hmm. uh, MPhil degree in uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University okay. and, uh, because I was doing my MPhil and it mm -hmm. was summertime. Uh, most of us went to the Teen Murti, you know, library because they had air conditioning and they had all of the latest books that you could find. So, uh, so in, a, in a, one of those hot summers in Delhi, so I was going to the Murti library along with my friends. And, you know, if you know Delhi, you cross, the bus goes through, you know, the bus from JNU goes all the way to Teen Murti library, but it crosses through uh, the embassies. So the Canadian High Commission was having an educational fair. Uh, many of my friends wanted to, you know, uh, study mm -hmm. uh, abroad. So we all got down and we all picked up, you know, some flyers. I picked up two because they were you know, doing, mm -hmm. two universities seemed um, great mm -hmm. of uh, uh, post-colonial studies. And so I picked mm -hmm. up a, a brochure for University of Toronto and a brochure for York University. And then everybody mm -hmm. was applying. So I thought, okay, you know, I will put in an application <laughs> as well. 
And then uh, I, I, the forms, some of the forms were missing in the University of Toronto application. And I, I had no plans, right? So then I just applied to the York University and lo and behold, I got scholarship. And then it was a real you know, dilemma as to, okay, mm -hmm. now what am I going to do? And uh, yeah, so mm -hmm. it wasn't planned. So it was, you know, okay. pure chance that I arrived in Canada as an you know, international student with uh, no desire or intention to mm -hmm. stay here, and here mm -hmm. I am now. All right, all right. Uh, uh, so, uh, ma'am, as a first-generation diaspora uh, living and working in Canada, what were the challenges that you initially had faced? Yeah, so when I came, you know, it, the context was very different. So I came in the early 2000s. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was very different from the context now where you have, you know, large number of uh, students coming from all parts of India, uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, and the larger South Asia to study here. When I came at York, you know, I was the only Indian international student. So we had one, you know, international student from India and then another person from uh, Nigeria. So we were the two sort of colored people in in, mm -hmm. in, the, in the group so um, and of course you know I mean you when you are in a new place and uh, you are looking for friends or sort of some kinds of you know cultural resonances so I automatically started you know making friends with other international students mm -hmm. who had come from you know India Pakistan you know Sri Lanka mm -hmm. and also sort of, you know other international students so that was sort of mm -hmm. the first sort of you know bonding and to this date my closest friend is my Nigerian um, classmate from oh, India, exactly. so you know so that was one about the challenges in terms of mm -hmm. uh, finding you know people who look like you or you know eat the same kind of food right so that's one and you know, ad adapting to a new place, right? Like you know, you know, physically in terms of weather, you know, emotionally, psychologically, you're far away from home. Uh, you don't really know anyone here. So it was, uh, you know, adapting to you know and, and learning. But I think again, you know, my experience in JNU, which was the first time that I had left home and living in Delhi in the university and meeting this diverse, you know, range of people from all over India. I think you know prepared me a little bit. Um, to sort of find some sense of home here. Uh, but mm -hmm. again, whatever, you know, other kinds of things, I would say food, food is something that is uh, so central to sort of, you know, uh, identity and who we are. And again, you know, you did not have um, Indian grocery stores uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, you had to go to the Indian uh, town, which was called, which is called Gerard Street here. So we would, you know, mm -hmm students we would sort of go there you know once in a while to eat you know indian food so those and you know and it was very expensive to make a phone mm -hmm. call, phone call to india mm -hmm. at that time mm -hmm. you know, we didn't have cell phones you know my parents didn't have a computer so just you know connecting with them was tough so you know so I, and i think it's true to most you know most immigrants and most people migrating to other places so similar challenges i think mm -hmm. okay okay uh, uh, so, ma'am, uh, what do you think uh, is immigration today? Is it a question of life or death or a mere uh, pursuance of privilege? And what is uh, Canada today, especially for Indians? I think immigra immigration means uh, different things to different people, right? Yeah, of course. People, people travel for all kinds of reasons. Mm -hmm. and, as you said, some cases, mm -hmm. it is it is a matter of life and death. Uh, so if mm -hmm. you think of you know the number of refugees uh, that have come into into Canada and continue to come into Canada, whether it's mm -hmm. you know uh, you know uh, Tamils from Sri Lanka who came in you know as a result of the civil rights, or you have you know Syrian refugees in the last few years, <coughs> so people travel for all, all kinds of reasons, right? Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you know you are trying to escape a place right and that can be based on your gender or religion or or yeah. sexuality right you're looking for a place that mm -hmm. not you know cast you out based on your identity you know mm -hmm. others i know travel for again desire for a better life right mm -hmm. uh, so you might have a job in your you know wherever your nation or your hometown but you, know, you travel out, outwards, right? Somewhere else for a better life for you and your family. So migration and you know, I think mobility is key to human, you know, movement, you know, human life. It has always mm -hmm. been there. Um, 
like you know uh, as one of you said you know one of you is you know based in mumbai you're right uh, you know even so there is cross cross travel also within india and beyond india uh, so in in the in the canadian context i think uh, you know the first uh, set of um, immigrants that came from uh, uh, india uh, came in, you know in, like in the early uh, sort of the late 1880s early you know 1990 10 1912 mm-hmm. you know at that time and and they came a- as a part of sort of labor migration so often semi skilled mm-hmm. low skilled migrants you know came and remember you know if you know of the komagata maru ship you know sort of the mm-hmm. um, incident this was 1914 it was a ship uh, full of indian immigrants pri- primarily sikh Im- mi- migrants who were coming to uh, canada they were all mm-hmm. you know holding british passports right so the assumption was they were part of the british empire and they could move anywhere freely mm-hmm. and they arrived in canada uh, on the shores of you know british columbia but uh, they were denied entry uh, because at that time there was an attempt to maintain a white canada there was a continuous journey mm-hmm. law at that time which required uh, you know if you you had to leave and reach canada uh, you know mm-hmm. from one place this ship had not left india it had left from um, hong kong so there were stops you know this this had you know uh, stop, it you did not travel directly from india and therefore you know the law stopped them from entering so there is you know that kind of a racial or racist history in terms of migration and an attempt to maintain a white you know canada uh, but mm-hmm. you know, in the 1970s and the opening up of uh, immigration policy and the liberalization of immigration policy you had large number of you know migrants coming in you and also mm-hmm. you know, the migration of indians is often not you know not directly from india they've also come from other places so if you mm-hmm. think of you know uganda or britain so there are also double double migration of mm-hmm. that has happened right so you know large number of you know migrants coming in from britain mm-hmm. or coming in from uganda africa mm-hmm. right and then with the 1990s you see another sort of you know large scale immigration of skilled workers um, either mm-hmm. coming in directly from india or coming in through gulf right so they've been in gulf countries for a while and then they're coming to canada so i think there are all different kinds of stories but uh, you know they are tied to the place that you left and the place you are coming to right uh, and mm-hmm. there are multiple there's no one kind of indian immigrant or south asian immigrant in in canada mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, ma'am. All right. Uh, why do you think uh, this uh, dichotomy uh, still persists in developed nations that uh, recognizes one as a skilled immigrant but does not recognize the Indian degree and jobs are that hard to find? yeah i mean i think it is you know tied to sort of you know the colonial educational system uh, that you know say and canada are part part of there is a hierarchy of you know of curriculums there is a hierarchy of uh, you know institutions so say even in, in my department you know when we have international students applying you know they have a list so these are the list of universities that have been approved right so there are questions of you know what kind of you know degrees are valid and which d- degrees are not and you're right that you know canada takes in you know large number of skilled immigrants you know they come in as doctors and engineers and then they end up driving taxis and they end up you know delivering pizzas right you are taking them in as skilled skilled migrants but then you are not honoring the degrees and the years of you know experience that has gone in there but then you also have large number of you know indian immigrants who are in these skills prof- profession mm-hmm. you know, at mcmaster university um, mm-hmm. which is you know known more as a medical school if you walk in there you would think you are in a part of india right mm-hmm. most of the doctors okay. are of, uh, of mm-hmm. south asian background like you know whether indian pakistani mm-hmm. bangladeshi right mm-hmm. uh, so there are you know you know skilled migrants who make it into their positions mm-hmm. as well mm-hmm. right but it is really really hard if you don't have uh, say what they call you know canadian experience so for somebody like me you know all my degrees were in india but one of the reasons that i was able to get a job here was because my degree my phd was from here and that mm-hmm. would not have been the case uh, if my phd was say from an indian institution mm-hmm. right or it would have been not that it would not but it would have been very rare or very difficult uh, it would not have been as easy for me to transition mm-hmm. from a graduate student you know right into a job 
right? Because there are lots of, you know, again, Indian, uh, you know, prof uh, professors who come in and find it very, very hard to break into the, you know, to the academic sort of institutions. They are doing, you know, uh, a course here, a course there, or, uh, you know, often teaching in colleges, which are a little bit easier. Uh, so you're mm -hmm. absolutely right that, you know, there is an immigration system mm -hmm. that values your skills, supposedly, you know, values mm -hmm. your experience, supposedly, and brings you in. But then there is a problem of, you know, incorporating you into the system. And that is also because of the associations. It's, you know, like mm -hmm. the medical associations, uh, the legal mm -hmm. associations who they have quotas. So they will only let so many people in. So, you know, so there is all of this, you know, negotiation, you know, between the government, you know, the federal government policy, the provincial government policy, mm -hmm. and the associations which want to have, you know, control and say over how many people will get in and how many. So there are, you know, friends I know, uh, colleagues I know who are, you know, writing the exam year after year, say, for instance, mm -hmm. get residency and they pass the exam. But, you know, maybe the quota is, you know, 100 people and they don't make that 100, uh, you know, uh, rank so mm -hmm. yeah so it, it is discriminatory of course okay thank you so much ma'am thank you uh over to you Megha. yeah am i audible yeah yeah if you are. Uh, okay ma'am uh, i was going through some of your essays and in one of them uh, called the shadow pandemic covid19 opens old fault lines you have mentioned how and quoting you Many non Asians do not distinguish between Asians and Asian Canadians or Asian Americans. To them, they are all simply Asian others, as appears to have been the case for an 84 year old Thai man who was pushed to the ground in San Francisco in January, and a Filipino man who had his face slashed on a Manhattan train. And then you go on uh, talking about the face race campaign that was established uh, to promote awareness against racism. And uh, we have seen throughout your entire essay how, and also the entire concept of the Orient, quote unquote, has been brought into question for the very genesis of the virus and it spread over the year. So while working on essays like these, um, how much can you, being an East, East Asian migrant yourself, um, relate with when it comes to your own coping mechanisms uh, with the country? that is not really your own, or if I may say that a country that has had a reputation of discrimination over the ages and it's still going on? Um, well, maybe, you know, mo most, uh, most countries, unfortunately, uh, have a long history of discrimination. I don't think it is unique to Canada. I think it is, uh, it is a persistent problem uh, with the category of the nation. Uh, in one country, it might be um, race, right? As you rightly said, in the context of, uh, you know, in uh, Canada, uh, uh, that produces discrimination. In other countries, such as India, uh, it could be, say, religion, right? Which is which is the current, you know, Definitely. scenario in India. In another case, it might be language, if you think of the Bangladesh war, right? Uh, or in another case, it might be class, caste. So, you know, we can go on to those categories, but I don't think, you know, discrimination is uh, a unique characteristic of, you know, any, any nation. Uh, minorities in, you know, different places uh, are marginalized for all kinds of uh, reasons, and as I said, and I think it is a problem of the category of the nation that works by creating a core or, or an original against which the others are always defined, right, in relation to it's a relational category. And for me, um, um, in terms of uh, coping, you asked, I would say um, it is through my uh, research, uh, my teaching, uh, my uh, public scholarship, um, that I have uh, tried to engage with these societal inequities and structures of difference, uh, you know, structures that separate different kinds of um, humans or define some humans as not human. So, uh, you know, and, and, you know, being in Canada, I think I'm also, you know, very privileged to learn from uh, Indigenous uh, uh, communities and the Indigenous histories of Canada, something uh, that is new and that I am, you know, and I know very little about, but I'm, you know, learning, you know, every day. And the place that, you know, I, I live in, you know, uh, is called Hamilton. It is about 45 minutes from um, Toronto. And this, you know, area of, you know, Hamilton, Toronto uh, is a um, land that 
that was the ter traditional territories of indigenous nations, you know, from Mississauga and the Chene people. And they're part of what is called the dish uh, with the one spoon, you know, uh, wampum agreement. And to me, um, you know, this just if you think of this metaphor, because you might not be you know, familiar with it, and again, something that I have learned, you know, in the last few decades. So the dish with one spoon suggests, if you think of it as, you know, I know you're literary uh, scholars as well. So if you think of dish with one spoon, so you have one dish and with one spoon. So the suggestion is that inevitably you have to share, right? You don't have multiple dishes and you don't have multiple spoons. You have mm -hmm. one dish with one spoon. So you have this land with its flora and fauna, with its people, and you have to share it with each other. And sharing also means that you can't just eat up everything that is there in the dish because there is somebody else waiting for you to pass the dish onto, right? So, so it, it builds this concept of you know, both responsibility to the land and the people that live on this land, uh, a recognition of those who came before me and before us, who has made it possible to live and inhabit inhabit this land that you know that I live in right now? Uh, so for me, you know, sort of indigenous histories, you know, open up space for sharing, caring, honoring, being responsible. And you know, the essay that you talked about uh, was an open in, in, the, in the local newspaper here. I mean, it talks of you know, it responds to sort of COVID nineteen and the anti Asian. Um, racism that we've seen as a result of COVID-19. But for me, you know, if COVID-19 and the global pandemic has taught us anything, I think it is our shared vulnerability, uh, our shared interdependence to each other, right? I can be well Absolutely. only when the person that I share my office space with is well. Only if the person that I'm sharing my, uh, you know, cafeteria table with is well. Only if the person that I'm sharing my the seat my seat on the bus is well, right? So, and from that sort of, you know, my personal interaction with this one other person, you can sort of broaden it up from that particularity to talk about, you know, the neighborhood or you know, sort of the vulnerability and the interdependence on, on, on you know, in terms of the province and the country and then you know sort of the uh, at the level of the global so I, I you know i take my you know privilege and and responsibility of you know living in a relatively you know peaceful canada quite seriously uh, some would say too seriously uh, i mean you know I, I have the i have the privilege of a job right a, a job and a profession that um offers me the opportunity to engage in you know critical and you know, productive even if difficult conversations on all kinds of you know uh, issues and it offers me an opportunity to shape you know young minds you know prompting them or you know encouraging them urging them to think of other ways of being relating to others you know imagining different future uh, futures sorry uh, so for me sort of you know the way i see myself um, as a teacher as an in, as an instructor uh, and my responsibility to the ground that i live on right uh, so all of the, that are my ways of you know engaging with with the with the present you know as i engage with sort of the past in the present yeah i, I hope that answers your you know question Yes, yes, very much. Actually, when you talk about this entire concept of neighborhood or your privileges, we tend to forget, like, we keep on complaining. Like, I myself kept on complaining about so many things, but I never care, like, cared to look into my privileges I am uh, equipped with. And I'm staying at home. Absolutely. Like, you no, know, for instance, Megha, like, the, uh, that, that we can stay at our homes and have exactly. this conversation. Mm -hmm. Many others do, do not have the privilege like us to be at home and you know carry on as if nothing has changed, right? Mm -hmm. If you're a frontline worker, if you have to be you know at that grocery store, you know mm -hmm. you are more vulnerable. If you are an elderly person, you are more vulnerable, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you're dependent again on your neighbors, hopefully for bringing your groceries, you know, helping you yeah. out, checking you, you know, checking on you. So I mean, we are privileged in so many different ways. Yes, we can yeah. throw our hands up and say yes, we are in the midst of a global pandemic. And I'm not sort of, you know, saying that yes, we are not, you know, we, all of us are not suffering or we are not suffering at different levels. But it is differentiated suffering. We are not suffering equally. And we often forget exactly. that, right? You know, based on race or based on, you know, again, gender, right? Who is doing more yeah. of the caregiving work? Highly, right? yeah. 
I have two kids at home. It's not easy to do your job with two screaming, running kids, you know, around you or who need to print out every five seconds, right? Uh, or somebody who has, you know, an older parent at home and mm -hmm. having to take care of them and constantly be anxious about, you know, is, you know, am I somehow going to put my, you know, parents at risk because they are older, right? So different, you know, people are dealing with it differently. Or if you're in a neighborhood which has large number of COVID cases and you know that you are not going to get your vaccine anytime soon, right? So you're, you know, so again, so I'm not sort of saying that, you know, different people are not affected, but they are differently affected. You know, it's it's not the same, you know, same. Definitely. Um, okay, moving to my next question. So uh, since you have specialized on an area that includes public memory, and also you are the very director of the Center for Peace Studies, so uh, would you say that this entire paradigm of remembering and its consequences on the very nationalistic identity of a migrant can work in harmony with the ultimate goal of attaining peace with the host country of the migrant? And like, how have your memories kept you intact in a foreign country? And so when was it actually you could uh, psychologically accept your migration in a way? That's a difficult question, I think, because there are you know number of um, questions in there. You know, and let me know if I don't sort of you know respond to all, and I'll come back. I'm trying to remember yeah. all the questions. Uh, so I think um, in in terms of my own you know sort of uh, of of thinking and research, you know, I've always been interested in questions of um, history and and questions of uh, memory you know sort of most of my sort of research and teaching can be sort of you know um, uh, can be sort of explained through that sort of an overarching uh, framework but I am not sure if um, remembering creates peace or forgetting you asked about remembering so you know that, that it's, it's a difficult question right like what we remember uh, how we remember you know when we remember uh, what do we remember in relation to what right uh, so and i think you know it, questions of peace cannot be um, entangled from um, questions of uh, justice right uh, unless structures of discrimination whether it's you know gender or it is race or it is class or, or religion or sexuality unless those structures uh, change or 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 are transformed or or rethought um, i don't know if we can achieve peace because you know peace can always be coerced right you know i can you know uh, you know i can put you know a, a group of people like a thugs or people with guns or whatever on my door and say you know don't say anything you know just keep quiet and, and don't be a problem right that is peace but is that uh, and that is temporary right it it cannot endure unless the structures that produce and 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 perpetuate uh, injustice is is changed uh, so so I, I don't know, like, you know, you know, qu questions of, uh, you know, memory and, and history and remembering and, and forgetting is, uh, is mm. yeah, it is entangled, right? Because even when we remember, you know, certain things, we remember them in the present, right? And there are reasons why certain things might uh, surface up in our, uh, you know, in our memories and others don't. Um, yeah. I think there was yeah. another question there, Megha, and I don't remember. So, yeah. uh, Ma'am, I was asking sure, like, was how, yeah, how you could uh, like psychologically accept your migration in the end, or like how have your memories uh, acted in a way in a, a foreign country? Okay, so I think for um, you know questions of memory has I think always been somewhere you know down in my head, but it took me a lot of you know I think it was much later in life that I realized why I am so interested in history and, and memory and that goes back to my childhood uh, my I know uh, parents uh, not my parents my grandparents but my dad they both migrated from uh, what is now Bangladesh right but my dad migrated um, not in 1947 but much much later as a young man who refused to leave Bangladesh. His entire family had by that time settled down for many years, you know, where in, in, in Kolkata and, you know, my, and my uncles were in Barakpur. They had settled, my, my dad and his 
parents, so my grandmother, right? So my dadu and dida, my grandmother and my grandfather and my dad. So those three people continued to live in Noakhali. And they, you know, as they called it, the troubles. So they were waiting for the troubles to subside. And then, you know, everybody could come back. So that was the story. So to this date, I have not been able to get my dad to go back to Bangladesh, right? And, you know, I have said many times, you know, we'll go together, we'll see the place that you grew up in. And the interesting thing is he's not been back in Bangladesh, right, since he's come, come uh, moved to, uh, you know, to, uh, to India. But he has this, you know, distinct, precise memories of a flowering plant in one particular part of the property. The distinct memories of this room outside the house, right? You had the Andar Mahal and, you know, so this mm -hmm. outer part of the house where he and his friends, and interestingly, many of them Muslim friends would meet up because they were not allowed entry into the inside part of the house, right? And the reason that he did not want to leave Bangladesh was that as a young man, with lots of Muslim friends, he was confident that he was safe, that his family would remain unharmed. So he refused to live, right? But, you know, ended up leaving. So he has this, you know, distinct memories. And I have been, you know, asking him that, you know, we should go back, you know, you have this precise memories. And only, you know, maybe, you know, five, six years back, I sort of realized that the reason that he refuses to go back to Bangladesh is because that house that he remembers so fondly and so precisely in it's, you know, the flower there and the coconut trees there and the pond on the right side of the corner of those trees, right? Those very specific mem memories are there in his head. He remembers it, but it does not have a reality on that on the ground. The house that they had, because, you know, they had all left, it was abandoned property. It was then taken up by the government. So it has become mm -hmm. government offices. So if he were to go back, it would completely fracture and break down the memory of his childhood home, his ancestral home, right? Mm -hmm. So he doesn't want to go there, right? He, he does not want to go there. So, you know, so now when I think back, you know, you know, why this interest, and I've always been interested in questions of, you know, the relationship between history and memory. And it is only in the last, you know, few years I've come to realize that this has been a perennial sort of uh, question in my head, in my, you know, in my, and, and maybe in my heart too, not just my head, right? So emotionally and, uh, you know, cognitively, this question of history and memory is something uh, that that is, you know, has always uh, sort of, you know, provoked me and pro uh, prompted me. Uh, so, you know, so the question of, you know, history and memory is uh, is important. And in terms of, you know, in, in Canada, um, you know, I, I came at a time where, uh, you know, there were not, you know, it was not, you know, a white Canada policy. There were other international students and immigrants here. You know, I was not, you know, st you know, standing, uh, you know, uh, out on the street because I was wearing, you know, a salwar kameez, or you know, I was not standing out because I was the only, you know, brown person on the street. Uh, so having a larger community sort of, you know, helps uh, you ad uh, to adopt into, a, you know, to a new place. But also the relationships that you develop with others, right? Uh, so you know, sort of the, you know, the friendships that I have made with, you know colleagues in say, you know, the department that I teach in, yes, those are people that I work with, but they are some of my closest friends, right? Both in my department and the university, mm -hmm. you know, largely. Uh, and, you know, then there are sort of, you know, friends in the community. So all of, you know, us, you know, sort of, I guess, sustain each other. And um, many have, you know, their own arrival stories, their stories of departure, right? And these are things that I teach. So Teaching, I think, is also one way of coping because I teach South Asian literature. I teach, you know, African literature, you know, all Anglophone, of course, African Caribbean literature. And they're all stories of, you know, arrival and departure and memory and history, right? And sort, mm -hmm. of, sort of thinking of, you know, all of these, we are often taught to think of, you know, you know, okay, this is Indian history or this is the South Asian story of migration. But I see themselves as, you know, relational stories, right? So, you know, so again, in my own teaching, I try to bring all of these different histories uh, together, not to say that they are same, but in their difference, right? So bring all of this together, you know, histories together and um, talk to them relationally, right? And the students in my class are made up of, you know, first generation, second generation, or maybe fourth generation immigrants. Some are international students who've just arrived. Some are, you know, uh, permanent residents who've just arrived. So I teach this diverse, 
you know, array of students mm -hmm. and just enrich the conversation, right? Uh, so even if we are, you know, doesn't matter what, you know, which text mm -hmm. I teach, I know there is somebody in that class who has mm -hmm. some, some connection to that place and can relate Definitely. to that place. So we have, you know, this amazing, you know, animated conversations about history, about memory, you know, all, all those kinds mm -hmm. of things. Those are sort of, you know, taking my own personal and, you know, uh, interest and then, you know, having a larger conversation, with the, you know, younger group of uh, of students. Uh, so, you know, that keeps me going, I think. <laughs> well, that's a very interesting way of like looking at memory and history and how you say that it's so difficult for uh, your father to go back to Bangladesh because he mm -hmm. has imagined the past and he is afraid that the reality will not hit him in a nice way. So that's yeah. really interesting and like very enlightening. And I will add, like my mom did not migrate, right? My mom's parents migrated. She was happy to go yeah. back. She wanted to go and see the place that she had heard yeah. about. So she was happy to go to Dhaka and, you know, all of that. Mm -hmm. But my dad, to this date, you know, he just refuses. He's like, no, if you want to go and see, I'll tell you what the address is. But I don't want to go there. And, you know, for years, you know, I was like, you know, no, we should go. You have all of these fond memories. Unless you go with me, who's going to show me? Like, I don't know. This <laughs> is, right? But now I realize that it is so wrong me to persist and, you know, ask him that, you know, so it's that I'm not asking him to do it for himself. I'm really asking him to you know, do it for me. And that's a very unfair burden to put on him, right? Uh, because, you know, that, you know, you don't want his, that memory to be fractured, right? Like, mm -hmm. that remembers. and it's amazing, he'll tell you, that plant, you know, and he'll name the plant, and, you know, <laughs> that flowering plant is on that portion of the property. It's, yeah, it's quite uncanny. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Okay, uh, over to you, Riyashini, for the next question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mom, I, I absolutely loved what you said. It was just a poem to me. And <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, so uh, Mom, the uh, relationship between uh, geography and writing and mm -hmm. the ways in which uh, the poetics of uh, dislocation inflects a uh, writer's creative output are all well explored issues in uh, diaspora studies. Um, and even at the risk of sounding cliched, I would like to ask you uh, how the travel and mobility shape up your literary aesthetics. So I think, you know, I sort of, you know, uh, I think maybe I responded to that bit in, in response to, you know, Megha's question, uh, because mm -hmm. both in terms of my, you know, teaching and research, you know, it is about, as I said, you know, I teach, you know, African immigrant you know writing in canada right or mm -hmm. i would teach you know writing by say african you know diaspora writers whether it is you know Gubi mm -hmm. or chinua achebe mm -hmm. or i will teach you know olive senior from say the caribbean or i will teach you know writers you know south asian writers whether it's anita rao badami or you know bharati Mukherjee, right so you know all kinds of you know uh, uma parameshwar mm -hmm. rene saklikar you know some are south asian canadian some are you know, uh, you know american mm -hmm. some are british like monica ali right mm -hmm. so i i teach so for me you know again as i said you know it's my teaching i think that um sort of um responds to some of these you know mm -hmm. deep personal issues uh, or or political issues and even sort of, you know, my uh, interest, like, you know, you asked about sort of literary aesthetics, sort of, you know, my um, uh, my research on, say, the 1985 Air India bombing or the Kanishka bombing, as we know it in India, mm -hmm. is deep, you know, developed from my teaching. So this was not a research project that I came up with saying, you know, I'm going to study the South Asian diaspora or what happened to, the, you know, in, in the 1985 Air India bombing. No, you know, I was teaching a course, I was developing a new course. Uh, it was mm -hmm. going to be called, you know, Mapping South Asian Masculinities for my department in English and Cultural Studies. And so I, uh, I was developing a course around political crisis and masculinities. So, you know, I had, you know, the partition of British India. I had the mm -hmm. civil conflict in Sri Lanka, you know, Bangladesh war, mm -hmm. all of those things. Mm -hmm. And then I thought to myself, well, you know, these are all based in South Asia, although this is a South Asian masculinities course, if we, if I frame the course as all of the violence, all of the trauma, all of the grief happening elsewhere, that's how my students then see South Asia, right? All of the violence happens there, all of the suffering happens there, not in Canada, right? So I thought, okay, you know, I have to include a section that has some South Asian content, but it has to be related to Canada. 
So I thought, you know, of course, you know, the Air India bombing, all my students would, you know, know, know about the Air India bombing. And, and so mm -hmm. I will have a section on, you know, the 1985 Air India tragedy. And of course, lo and behold, I, I realized that my students mm -hmm. don't know about this, you know, Air India uh, bombing, although mm -hmm. it had been, uh, and this was 2010, and, and mm -hmm. that is when you had the public, you know, uh, the federal government apology and the public inquiry had just come out, which had called it or, or characterized it as, quote unquote, a Canadian tragedy. So for my students coming into my undergrad class and grad class, and for the first time hearing about the Air India tra tragedy was shocking to them and it was shocking to me because I mm -hmm. thought they should just know this is their history, it's, it's Canadian yeah, history. Yeah. They might not mm -hmm. know partition and they might not know, you know, what happened during the Bangladesh war, but why don't they know about, you know, Canadian history? So that's where sort of, you know, that, you know, sort of teaching and research project started. And I thought, well, you know, if I know about this, then, and there has to be, other South Asians or other mm -hmm. South Asian studies scholars working on this. So mm -hmm. in 2011, what I tried to do was, you know, create the first, uh, you know, sort of collection. Uh, I did a feature section for Topia Journal of, you know, uh, Canadian Cultural Studies. And my attempt there was to look for other people. Who else is working on the Air India tragedy? You know, how are there? There must be people doing PhDs. There must be other people. It can be just, <laughs> I'm so late in the game. There must be other people before me. Mm -hmm. so then I, you know, put together that, you know, a sort of uh, feature section because you know there were 329 people that were that were killed of which 280s 80s uh, were citizens or permanent residents of Canada there were 82 children under the age of 13 how could you not remember right or how mm -hmm. could you forget right uh, it has been called um, you know Canada's worst mass, worst murder, mass murder. right yeah. yet it is barely remembered in this country right so why so that was my question right why mm -hmm. hasn't this uh, tragedy uh, claimed a prominent place in Canadian history and public memory mm -hmm. because you know uh, I mean I know some of the families and now many of the families and year after year that is their question right why does nobody care you know why mm -hmm. is grief seen as not worthy of public mourning. And so, you know, from that, you know, teaching and my students' deep interest and frustration that they did not know about this history, it mm -hmm. got me started uh, sort of, you know, in this uh, research project. And then, you know, in 2019, I did a conference where we brought in, you know, artists and family members, many of the artists who are family members and how they have dealt with this grief, mm -hmm. with this tragedy, as well as international scholars. In 2017, with my colleagues, you know, Amber Dean and Angela mm -hmm. Fair, uh, we put together a book called, you know, Remembering Air India, The Art of Public Mourning, which was, again, a collaborative effort with families, artists, scholars uh, to, you know, claim a place for this uh, tragedy to mourn it together, to collectively uh, uh, remember it. And uh, and so, you know, and, and sort of arguing how, um, you know, grief persists and how mm. grief persists, even though it has been 35 years now, right? And grief mm. persists even after a federal government's apology and grief persists even after, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Public Inquiry Commission uh, report because families, friends, neighbors, and communities continue to mourn the loss of loved ones. Mm -hmm. And through this, you know, through this work, then, you know, as I got to, uh, you know, meet more families and talk to them, you know, it sort of moved into uh, an archival project because many family members then, you know, was willing to trust me with their stories, were willing to, you know, trust me, not just with interviews, but with actual artifacts, right? So calligraphy, mm -hmm. poems, letters, drawings, mm -hmm dance right different ways that they have remembered forgotten tried to remember right trying mm -hmm. to cope with uh, so then you know that resulted in a conversation with mcmaster university library mcmaster is where i teach so you know a conversation with the library archive is saying you know i can not just take these precious memories uh, that these family members have hold, held mm -hmm. on since 1985, I can't just you know mm -hmm. it from their home and put it in a in a room in my home, right? It has to be honored. It has their memories have to be respected, right? Uh, we mm -hmm. have to remember these stories beyond their lifetime and beyond my lifetime, right? So how do you make that part of mem public memory? So my sort of you know thinking around that was you know creating a public memory archive, and so that's what you know sort of I'm you know trying to do now to create an archive, uh, archi archival collection, which will be the first archival collection on the you know, Air India tragedy, which, mm -hmm. which is not an engagement with, you know, who put the bomb or how was the bomb put, you know, what kind of terrorism it was. 
but the families because the question of terrorism has been raised in the indian uh, sorry in the canadian public realm you know canadians are aware of the terrorist act but mm -hmm. not of the grief you know not of the loss not of the pain of being not mm -hmm. recognized as canadians and that's sort of the story that i want mm -hmm. to bring into sort of you know public conversation uh, so so that sort of you know uh, you know again as i said you know i'm um, all of my work and thinking can be sort of um, put together under this large bucket of you know the relation between you know history mm -hmm. and public memory. Uh, even my first book it was on you know Indian nationalism, and it was again around questions of you know how people like Rabindranath Tagore or or, or, mm -hmm. or uh, Gandhi ha has been remembered or are being you know re resurrected in terms of the needs of the present or what's happening in India in the present, right? Uh, so in all, you know, different kinds of ways, it's all talking about the entanglement of, you know, history and memory and mostly, you know, nationalist history. So how do um, uh, nations tell the, their story the, or the stories about themselves? And how might, say, uh, you know, familial stories, stories that are told within the family or stories that are, you know, told within the community, how might mm -hmm. they fracture or disrupt or shift national stories right so what is mm -hmm. the relationship between this you know top down you know nationalist history or, or storytelling and stories that might be coming out from the family and the home right so say example sort of you know my, my dad's story of bangladesh right uh, versus mm -hmm. what i teach and i learn about the partition through work by you know feminist scholars uh, like say Uvashi Batalia or ruthu menon or gyan pandey right and sort of novels and fiction and films that i teach so then that sort of, you know, the academic knowledge base, but then also sort of, you know, my personal, my lived experience that mm -hmm. flow through that, you know, archive mm -hmm. of, of knowledge, yeah. Uh, so, uh, ma'am, what uh, are the possibilities of uh, archival research in uh, South Asian diaspora studies? Um. I think you know there is some work happening. So, for instance, you know, work that I know of are the um, oral history archives, the oral partition history archives, at say you know uh, University of Berkeley, where you know they are teaching you know uh, just you know lay citizens how to do oral interviews, right, uh, with family members. Because you know the worry is you know similar to the Air India uh, archive that when that you know that generation go mm -hmm. the stories would go with them right they will not become part of our story our history right and, mm -hmm. and, and, and by our i just don't mean you know national or canadian but i mean global right part of our global mm -hmm. history so so i know of that you know sort of partition archive work that's happening in berkeley then i know uh, like simon fraser university that is based in uh, you know mm -hmm. vancouver they've done an archive on the 1914 you know komagata maru uh, incidents, mm -hmm. so stories, interviews, photographs, mm -hmm. right? All of mm -hmm. that. And, and so there are scholars and then there are, you know, community members uh, who mm -hmm. are collaborating and, and working on archival projects. But of course, there is, you know, lots more that and that mm -hmm. can be done and, you know, uh, be, uh, should should be done. Um, I'm thinking, you know, of um, of Hamilton. I, I don't remember when, but a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and maybe it was, you know, the Indian Independence Day celebration or it was a Diwali celebration. I don't remember, but there was a little um, sort of, uh, um, uh, you know, an exhibition kind of, like you know, just a couple of panels with images uh, that were put up in the Hamilton City Hall, and this was about uh, the first migration of South Asians to Hamilton like many of them Indians. Mm -hmm. And one was a fantastic story. You know, I knew this man, but I did not know of the story. He was one of the first uh, person to arrive in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then he got, uh, he was going to get married. So this was a mm -hmm. Hindu couple. At that time, there was no Hindu temple in Hamilton, right? Mm -hmm. So there was, you know, so the church, so one mm -hmm. of the churches opened up its space and they had a, a, a whole Hindu, you know, marriage ceremony that was done within the church so you know i mean you know, we, we talk of grief we talk of suffering right yes those mm -hmm. stories of grief and suffering are often marginalized and have to be told but these stories mm -hmm. also have to be celebrated right uh, that mm -hmm. you know here is a church that is opening up space for Hindu marriage, you know, how do we, you know, be hospitable? So we tell mm -hmm. our you know, stories of Canada's inhospitability, right? But we also mm -hmm. have to tell these stories of hospitality, right? That's what made life livable for many of the immigrants. It was not all pain. It was not all suffering, right? It, you know, there were moments, you know, there were ebbs and flows, 
right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so, you know, say, for instance, if there could be an archive on, um, so even in the small town of mm -hmm. Hamilton, about, say, mm -hmm. Hamilton residents or, you know, the story of South Asian migration to Hamilton, uh, for mm -hmm. instance. Um, so, yeah, that would be amazing. And I think, you know, there are lo lots, lots that can be done. Uh, and I mm -hmm. hope you know, different people will take up, you know, both community because all archives does not have to be institutionalized, right? It does not have to be based in the mm -hmm. university or an association. It could even be community archives because many of the first, you know, immigrants have stories to tell, have, you know, uh, these, you know, wonderful stories to tell of, you know, how, you know, people have opened up homes and spaces so that they could feel at home uh, in a new place, right? So there are questions of, you know, racism, but there are also questions of, you know, friendship and hospitality, mm -hmm. right? Hosti hospitality, right? So mm -hmm. all of that, right? So you know, what makes a place habitable? What makes a place mm -hmm. uninhabitable? And it's and it's both, right? Mm -hmm. So lots of scope would be my, you know, lots of opportunities. I would be my sort of, you know, uh, short answer. Yeah. Uh, uh, like, ma'am, I was uh, uh, quite intrigued uh, by the title of your and anthology remembering air india the art of public mourning mm -hmm. uh, so if you could uh, offer us a little insight into the politics behind the art of public mourning because uh, as far as i know uh, there was no mass mourning um like if you could uh, yeah talk a bit that. sure you know so um the um, the remembering air india book is you know as i sort of uh, you know mentioned it's a collaborative work uh, it is an effort to uh, prioritize and and privilege you know artistic voices uh, so, mm -hmm. so, you know, so we have you know poetry we have short stories we have excerpts from novel uh, we have photographs right we have you know images from a dance you know drama performance so we are looking at you know artistic voices um, mm -hmm. artists who have you know uh, creatively remembered the air india tragedy and many of these artists that are featured in the book are actually also family members not all of them but many of mm -hmm. them who have used art as a way of you know engaging with this you know tragedy mm -hmm. one example i will give you is uh, of uh, lata pada uh, lata pada you, you know is a, a, a is a famous you know bharatnatyam dance uh, teacher she you know a performer she's based in mississauga again you know part of the large to Toronto area. She lost her two daughters and her husband on that flight. And in, in 19, I, and the year might be wrong, I think 1992, 1998, she produced this, um, you know, uh, dance drama. So mm -hmm. she was a dancer, her two daughters were, you know, fabulous dancers. After they died, she stopped mm -hmm. dancing. Mm -hmm. She could not dance, she stopped dancing. 10 years later, she started dancing and then dance became her way of engaging with the with the loss of her two daughters. So in my mm -hmm. interviews with her, like, you know, she will say that, of course, you know, I, I don't have, you know, um, my daughters, they are gone. But as I am teaching dance, you know, somebody will twirl their hair in a particular way or, or, or turn their hand in a particular way. And I see gestures, or bits and pieces of my daughter in those gestures and movements. Right. So, so dance has become her way of, you know, uh, dealing with that grief, right? Mm -hmm. Addressing that grief. So, in uh, so she created created this dance drama performance, which she performed once. You know, there are no, uh, you know, sort of other performances of that. But she did this mm -hmm. dance drama performance where she tells the story of, you know, how the phone rang. She was still, you know, uh, here. She was supposed to follow her husband and her daughter in a in a week, and then the phone rang, and she heard that the plane had crashed and then what it meant to be a widow right a, a, a hindu widow and the rituals of widowhood you know the repressions of you know patriarchy in terms of hindu widowhood what what it has meant for her right to uh, to be alone in canada what it has you know how it has fractured her. so she tells sort of you know, narrativizes her own so, whole story through dance right Mm -hmm. So we have, say, for instance, you know, images from Lata and sort of a little, you know, piece from her. And then we have, you know, an essay on, on the dance drama. So so mm -hmm. for, for us, you know, uh, it is creative uh, writing, creative uh, performances that mm -hmm. That is, is the other archive. So we are trying to create an alternative archive to the official archive. So the official archive is of terrorism. The official mm -hmm. archive is of, you know, Indian immigrants who brought their problems to this mm -hmm. country and messed it up. 
Mm -hmm. right? It is this foreign tragedy. This is a foreign problem. It is India's problems with its minorities that Canada has had to deal with. So that is sort of the official, official, you know, narr narration, uh, and this creative remembrances, you know, tells the story differently, right? It connects this sort of, you know, the 1985 tragedy to a longer history of partition of the 1984, you know, violence against Sikhs of, you know, Komagat, you know Komagata Maru. So it creates this, you know, intricate pathways into a past history. Mm -hmm. and brings them all into the present and creates this you know whole trajectory of south asian you know migration or the experiences of you know south asian migrants in canada so so it was a collaborative effort with with scholars and artists you know creative artists and trying mm -hmm. to create a conversation between them uh, it was an attempt to see you know artwork whether it's poetry or whether it's fiction as testimony as witness so rather than you know scholarly work or uh, you know doing the telling you know we see artistic works itself as bearing witness to the story right mm -hmm. so the role of art objects in opening up you know spaces for mourning right so the art of public mourning so again the privileging of art privileging of you know marginalized voices many of these artists are little known or unknown so this was also a way to bring them sort of into a mainstream conversation hoping that they would show up in educational curriculums, they would show up in, in 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 conversations. So again, you know, our collective effort with families who lost loved ones, with artists mm -hmm. who are creatively remembering the Air India mm -hmm. tragedy, and then scholars, right? So it's a combined, you know, collective mm -hmm. effort to collectively mourn this tragedy, mm -hmm. tragedy, and sort of haul it back from oblivion into public memory right public so the memory, book tries to do that i try to do that through my teaching many of us teach you know uh, things from that book or you know other things so again a collective effort between scholars mm -hmm. and family to wound together because often the families you know um, feel that it is their story it's their mm -hmm. thing but it has effect to a larger generation of south asian immigrants who bear these stories or who you know continue this legacy of loss right uh, so yeah so so again you know a collaborative collective endeavor mm -hmm. uh, to you know mourn together to grieve together and to think creatively about about mm -hmm. the past and as well as you know the relationship between the past mm -hmm. and the present so yeah Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was really insightful. Uh, over to you, Megha. Yeah, and um, it, it was very insightful, and I was like overwhelmed yeah. with all that you shared. So I'll just uh, slightly move to religion now. So um, in your uh, reputed work called uh, Masculinity, Asceticism, Hinduism, uh, Past and Present Imaginings of India, so you have this skillfully and analytically pointed out the very extremities of manhood aligned with the historical anchoring of the Indian asceticism. And so apart from this political, religious and social utilities of such manhood, how would you uh, trace the very quote unquote prejudice caused by such idealism when it comes to the women of the society? Yeah. So. Uh... I think you know ma masculinities uh, has to be um, understood in uh, relation to you know other categories, right? It is not a standalone category; it's a relational category. So it has to be um, you know understood in relation to say race or class or caste or ethnicity, nation, religion, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? Sexuality, because these um, social categories um, determine the reproduction of certain forms and certain practices of masculinity, right? And they're also products of particular places and particular times. So masculinity is not one thing, right? It is a relational category that you know shifts and changes form and takes up new form uh, based on the time period we are talking about, right? Based on the historical context and geography, right? Different cultures have different you know versions of masculinity. Uh, so in in my um, that first book, what I looked at is um, I looked at you know. Um, 
sort of four, how I sort of, you know, structured it as four symptomatic moments in Indian nationalist history. And I looked at, you know, anti-colonialism. So I looked at, you know, um, writings by, you know, Bankim Chandra Chattopadhyay for that chapter. And then I looked at, you know, Swadeshi nationalism. So I looked at, you know, Rabindranath Tagore. Uh, then I looked at Gandhian nationalism. So I looked at, so, you know, anti-colonialism, Swadeshi, Gandhian nationalism, and then I looked at Hindutva or the Hindu right. So though that was sort of the frame of that chapter. And, and again, you know, looking at the you know, relationship between nationalism and, and masculinity. But the focus was on the relationship, you know, between ascet asceticism and nation. And as you sort of, you know, brought up, like, what does that mean in terms of women? Well, you know, in terms of my, you know, uh, research and, and work and what I, you know, uh, have found is that ascetic nationalist uh, discourse uh, is, is a very masculinist discourse. I mean, it changes, you know, it is not the, you know, uh, Bunkin's uh, version of ascetic nationalism is not the same as Gandhi's version of ascetic nationalism is not the same as the Hindu rights version of ascetic nationalism. But all of those various very different, you know, versions of ascetic nationalism have something in common. And that is the emphasis on celibacy. Right. The emphasis on celibacy and the casting of family life as an obstacle uh, to nationalist commitment. And this nationalist com commitment is differently de defined for you know, all of these various people. Right. Their understanding of, of nation or nationalism is not the same. Uh, but in all of that, we see a marginalization of women. Right? Because women don't have have a, a space or a place within that ascetic nationalist discourse. You know, they are seen as forces of chaos, right? Uh, because desire is chaotic. You know, they are seen as forces to be feared because they might, you know, shift men from following their true path of, you know, nationalism and whatever that nationalism might be. So in all of these texts in different ways, you know, um, women figure as... Um, as, as objects, you know, as objects of desire or objects that uh, one has to fear, but they're always obstacle, right? Or they have to become, you know, good companion and partners who will allow men to follow their rightful path, right? So that they can demonstrate their proper, you know, masculine, you know, conduct. Uh, so in, in, in all, you know, all of these very different figures uh, who think of nationalism very differently, like, you know, Tagore is in fact, you know, critical of, of nationalism. But even if you think of, you know, a novel like, um, Ghore Bairi or Home and the World, right? Uh, the, uh, you know, what's her name? Uh, Bimola, right? So the character Bimola and, you know, the desire of two men for Bimola, right? Her husband, uh, Nikhil, and um, her friend, what's the name of the friend? Sandeep, right? So again, but how, you know, Bimola is this figure of, you know, desire, who's desired and is desirable, but also fractures the relationship between these two men and their friendship. Uh, so ascetic nationalist masculinity, you know, uh, differs from context to context, differed from, you know, based on these various figures. But I think it's sort of the uh, emphasis on celibacy that, you know, casts women out and, and marginalizes women and also, you know, produces them as, as objects of fear. And as I said, and or objects of desire, which both then require control by men. Absolutely. And as you mentioned, Gore by the way, I can so relate with uh, Tabor's uh, Chokher Bali as well. Yes. Like how Binodini has been literally victimized in a way when the men are supposed to be in question. Yeah. So, uh, okay, like you mentioned, you have taken up different inputs and cited Tagore or Gandhi or Bunkin So, would you say that uh, the very historical acceptance of the historical significance of uh, erudite like these and uh, is it like the the question lies in the way they are adhered to the very Hindu right? Um, yeah, I should first say that you know the the various uh, sort of you know nationalist icons that I uh, discuss in my book are very very different. You know they are not one one and the same thing. The Hindu right would like us to think that way, but that is an appropriation. Right, uh, the sort of you know the masculine figure that we say say in Bunkim's you know Anandamant, you know the Shantans, right, the male sons, uh, you know the the devoted um, uh, sons who are now going to fight uh, for the motherland is not the same thing as Tigor's version of uppercase man, right, where Tigor is you know saying that you know it doesn't matter national borders doesn't matter what is important is uh, is is sort of the universality of of friendship and brotherhood. 
right? That is very different from what, you know, Tagore, uh, sorry, Bunkim is saying. Or Gandhi's nationalism, right? Uh, the Hindu right, you know, quotes uh, the Bhagavad Gita to talk about violence, right? Dharma youth, um, that, you know, we, you know, violence is justified and we have to be violent in, our, in, uh, in order to prove our, our manhood or to reclaim our manhood, right? Mm -hmm. Gandhi is saying something very different. He's still quoting the Gita. Right. But he's emphasizing, you know, you know, nonviolence. So, you know, very different figures doing very different things, but they have been taken up, you know, differently. So for, you know, inst you know, instance, you know, um, uh, Tagore and, you know, his version of, uh, you know, this, you know, divine man. And he's constantly saying that the problem, you know, in his um, collection of essays, nationalism, for instance, you know, he's constantly saying that the problem in India is not political, it's social. So unless we, there is a social transformation, the inequities, the injustices that we see in the society will continue even after the British leave. So what is needed is a social reorganization, right? Uh, what we need is a change in the social reorganization. And again, you know, I, I mentioned Ghoria Baire and or Home and the World, and we see that in the character Nikhil the Zamindar, right? Who wants a social transformation, whereas you know Sandeep would go out and you know burn the clothes that the poor peasants need, right? So very different, you know, versions of nationalism and, and Tagore is very critical of it, right? Or say, for instance, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, the Hindu rights emphasis on Ram, right? And the version of Ram that we see now is this aggressive, uh, militant, weaponized figure of Ram. But for both, you know, Gandhi and Tagore, for them, the most important aspect of Ram's life was, as they say, I quote, as an incarnation of divine love. Mm -hmm. right? So we are yeah. still talking of the same yeah. figure of Ram and Ram Rajya, but Gandhi's definition of Ram Rajya could not be as far as you can possibly think of in, in terms of the Ram Rajya that we see mm -hmm. being established. In, in or you know or the efforts to establish a Ram Rajya in sort of the Hindu right version of it, right? You know, Gandhi is talking of you know. Um, you know, Hindu-Muslim relationship. Tagore is talking about, you know, Hindu-Muslim relationship of, you know, anti-caste uh, efforts. And here, and then you have, you know, Hindutva's, you know, version of Ram as, uh, as you know, creating this Hindu-only, only nation. Uh, so while, you know, both Tagore, Gandhi, very, very critical of, you know, revolutionary terrorism, uh, Hinduization of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, nation, as I said, you know, Tagore constantly saying, you know, humanity is far get greater than nation, uh, than manliness. Uh, he's constantly talking about the Mughal contribution to Indian, Indian life and to Indian civilization. He himself says, um, you know, of his own uh, family, I don't you know, remember the uh, essay now, but where he talks about, you know, my own family is a confluence of three cultures. Uh, it is, you know, Hindu, it's uh, Muslim, and it is British. And it is the confluence of all of these cultures that have, you know, made me who I am. So, you know, there are, you know, so all of these very, very different figures have been unfortunately and very strategically appropriated by the Hindu right, right, to create this whole, you know, discourse of ascetic nationalism, you know, coming, you know, from all the way to, you know, mystics and saints uh, and, you know, uh, uh, from the sort of the Sepoy mutiny to write up to uh, today, but that is a construction. It is a, an invention. Uh, it is strategic to serve the needs of the time and to serve a particular, uh, you know, political agenda that is sectarian, uh, and that is not what you know India is. Yeah, uh, quite rightly. And as you say, like I literally got goosebumps when you mentioned Gandhi's uh, way of looking at it, and I was reminded of how he says that the rightful way to attain home rule or the essentiality of the Swadeshi movement in Hind Swaraj. Like I read the book as a ch like child and I could mm -hmm. hardly understand anything back then. But now when I read it again, I'm like, oh my God, this is like a revolution. An enlightenment and, and, their, and their focus is on self-transformation. You know, also yeah, something yeah, to remember is that, you know, Tagore was very close to Bunkim when he started his career. Like he believed in Swadeshi. You know, he thought of Bunkim as his model when he started writing, but then he shifted. When he saw the violence of Swadeshi, he shifted. So, I mean, we can pick up, you know, one moment of Tagore's life and say, well, he was a nationalist. But then we have, you know, so which which part, which Tagore are we talking about, 
right? Or which Gandhi are we talking about, right? Which, you know, because, you know, you can find every possible way to contradict Gandhi by what Gandhi himself has written about him. So given the hundred volumes, right? So, so we can mm. choose and create our own storylines, right? Uh, but, you know, it, it is a strategy meant for a particular political end. Definitely, definitely. Can't disagree. Uh, okay. And uh, so my question, next one is, so right now that we're talking about uh, the way uh, how asceticism has been quite inclined to just a uh, very basic concept of manhood. So uh, in your co-edited anthology uh, named Mapping South Asian Masculinities, Men and Political Crisis, after reading almost like four to five essays, I sort of uh, derived out this very one common idea in most all of them, most of them, that how the this conceptualized uh, idea of valor or courageousness in a man uh, enhances the very concept of violence in a way. And we tend to overlook the very idea of it, the very uh, similarity between these two ideas. So how would you comment on it? Yeah, I think, you know, again, you know, similar to uh, masculinity, I think, you know, I would um, define uh, valor because valor is, again, you know, defined uh, differently uh, by cultures and by religions, uh, by regions, right? So it differs over, over time and space and from place to place. Uh, so for, again, you know, if I can go back to sort of Gandhi, so valor for Gandhi was the ability uh, to, you know, be able to self-transform oneself and the ability to endure violence on the body without hitting back, right? So that's Gandhi's you know, say definition of valor, that are you strong enough, are you man enough uh, to be able to endure violence on the body, the physical violence on the body without, you know, by default, you know, hitting back an eye for an eye. But, you know, in the Hindu right context, it means very different. Valor is that you know you have to be the aggressor, you have to prove your masculinity, you know, through violence. So again, you know, it means different things, and it you know differs from you know context to context. I will say, uh, but you know, uh, you know, we can see what you know violence is um, doing in India in the in the current time, and so yeah, I mean. I think that's what I'll say that, you know, it differs from different, you know, place to place, time to time. And uh, uh, it has to be sort of situated historically and temporally. And it serves, again, you know, different purposes at different times. Uh, so it, it will depend on, on how it is defined. Um, you know, I'm thinking here, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, I'm thinking, you know, I was talking about JNU. So I'm thinking of, you know, JNU here, how, uh, you know, I think of, you know, my, um, now going to JNU and and studying there as as sort of you know a, a, a self transformation as somebody uh, who you know grew up like all of you guys with this you know um, unity and diversity phrase that we were all taught in India you know we have all of these different cultures we have all of these different religions we have all of this different food we have all of these different festivals but we are one right and it is only when I went to you know JNU I, I saw that happen in front of me, right? I met people who spoke languages that I had only read in the books, you know, or wore clothing, and they were all in my class, right? You know, sort of, you know, again, some of my closest friends, you know, one from Tamil Nadu, one from Bihar, one from Orissa. So it was an amalgamation of sort of you know all of these cultures, sort of you know Tagore's Vishwa Bharati in a way, right? So you have all of these cultures, and it's so interesting to me that JNU is now you know the anti-national university. And again, you know, it goes back to how nationalism is defined, because, you know, in a weird way for me, if you ask me, I, I would say well, I became a nationalist when I went to JNU. Because before I saw the yeah. nation functioning in books and articles and films that I might watch. But here I was living my every day, my day to day with others very different from me. Right. As different as it could be, say, a, a white Canadian different religion, different caste, different class, different gender, you know, maybe different sexuality. So all, and I was living life with them and coexisting with them, right? So, so what is nationalism, right? So for me, it is, you know, it, it is sort of Tigor's version of, of, of difference, 
rather than sameness and being able to hold on to those exquisite you know difference that makes india so so wonderful not forgetting that the repressions and the marginalizations that also happen because again if there is difference there is a hierarchy of difference right difference is not the same thing uh, so you know quite alert to the sort of the, the marginalizations and the uh, and the suppressions that you know difference process but it is those you know multiple differences that i saw play out in in genu and that is the first time i had traveled out of home and i met you know all of these uh, people and have become you know lifelong friends with people who could not be as different as possible from me right not only did i you know encounter um you know calcuttans you know i come from a small small town right uh, so i don't think of kolkata as home kolkata is a place you know i studied in or kolkata is i you know a place i visited to buy books right like i think of you know college street and you know sort of the book stalls or particular restaurants but i don't think of kolkata as home you know i think of hugli as home as the place you know where my parents are and i have childhood memories of you know roads and streets and you know and and the schools you know chandonagar where i studied and then jnu i think of as home right i i live there and these are all of these places not really delhi but jnu so it's you know it's it's very strange so you know so here you have a university that is bringing all of this multiple uh, differences together and also making you aware of you know the differences and therefore the inequities and then when you are so aware of the inequities and you raise questions about the nation uh, national policies or you ask the nation to do better then you get termed as an as anti national right so what is valor so it it seems to be uh, the ones who are in power define what valor is and then the rest of us or you know the rest of the people are supposed to sort of you know fall in line uh, and uh, perform whatever is defined as you know valor uh, so uh, i think it's a question of power right who uh, establishes these categories who has the power to define those categories and who has the power to intervene so when you have you know university youth um, intervening raising questions about you know why can't we do things differently what are the possibilities of of a different future what could be done differently how can we bring all of these different groups of people uh, together some you know some groups have a problem with that so it's a question of you know who decides for us uh, who can intervene so it, it's all tied to questions of power as to who you know who sets up the categories and who falls in line and and follows the script and who goes you know unscripted so i'm going unscripted here so we will see you know what you know, how this interview lands me in trouble so we will see. okay thank you so much ma'am uh, over to you dashan yeah uh so ma'am uh, thank you so much uh, for your time and for sharing with us your knowledgeable insights and it was a wonderful conversation thank you once again uh, so with this we end our conversation Thank you so Bye. much. This is really lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation.